Uh, thanks so much for coming, uh, Katie Demology, uh, who is uh, now part of the TLC and uh, you know doing been around I think in Kubernetes for a bit now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, thanks for doing our little car interviews. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you want to tell us a little bit maybe about kind of your background, maybe how you got into Kubernetes in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, thank you very much for having me here. It's a very unique interview, so yeah. definitely couldn't miss it out as an right. experience. Uh, in terms of myself, um, I'm currently a senior field engineer for Apple. And pretty much I'm trying to bring the Kubernetes and cloud native expertise to different products and uh, teams within Apple. However, I've been in, in, involved in cloud native for a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was this is my actually second term as a TOC. Uh, I've been working for CNCF as a full time employee as well, so I have a lot of relations, uh, kind of or connections with with this community. Um, what got me started was uh, my job at Condé Nast. That's when we had mm -hmm. to create a platform from scratch, and the basis or the fundamentals of it was Kubernetes, oh. and that's how we implemented this, adopted it. But at the same time, I got connected to the community. That was my first interaction, and I never looked back since. Nice, nice. Yeah. Did you uh, get to travel to all of the Condé Nast places? When you were with Actually, them? no. No, uh, yeah. no. They they had a headquarters in London. I, uh -huh. They still they still have it, but uh, I've been based in London only. Um, ah, yeah. I think I was that close to visit the the New York office as well, uh, uh -huh. which is in the One World Trade. It's right, like a right. beautiful location with like a beautiful view uh, across New York. But right. I just gave my resignation, so I couldn't join. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. Yeah, oh. maybe maybe in the future. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it always has uh, really pretty pictures. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. the team itself is so very talented, and like yeah. the the amount of inspiration they get out of nowhere, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's yeah, very, cool. very, how can I say it? Uh, unique, right, <laughs> definitely right. unique. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, so, uh, talk a little bit about, or to ask a little bit about, uh, you know, what do you feel like? Um, you know, you're now on the TOC for the second time. Mm -hmm what's keeping you there? Like, what is so engaging about working with the the oversight committee? It's a very good question. I think um, I always i am very motivated to be involved in the community. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, this is one of the best ways to, to give back. Because, uh, yes, you can be a contributor writing code. You can be a contributor being part of multiple SIGs and working groups, which I'm doing as well. But mm -hmm. um, I would like to steer a bit of the, the decisions and actually be more of a... Um, kind of visionary in terms of what tools can be within the CNCF um, and what tools can be the right uh, or the kind of the cutting edge technology that the community can adopt. And being in the TOC, you actually get that opportunity, not only to interact with the latest, like the newest startup companies, but to actually help them mm -hmm. to, to be part of the, the landscape. Uh, so pretty much we are steering this technical vision for, for the ecosystem. And I, and I like that very much. So being the TOC, it's, I think it's a very privileged position. It's only 11 of us in total. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a two year term base uh, and you can do it only twice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, definitely we feel very privileged to be in that position and to actually influence from that from that regard. Um, what's keeping me here, uh, the community, I, I couldn't emphasize that enough. Uh, it's always meeting people from all around the world, different companies. They have such a diverse uh, experience in terms of adopting technology and using it that it's always nice to connect and actually explore how they do things and why they do things. So right, I think right. that is never something that um, is in, like um, that's always going to surprise me. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's definitely a good a good place to be. Yeah, I think yeah. that's one of the beauties of kind of open source in general, right? It's like you can connect with the community around the stuff you're doing mm -hmm. with way less secrets, right? Yes. Um, because, you know, yeah, of course there's some, you know, what you're doing exactly in your internal organization or whatever is often secret. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of talk about it in concept. You can talk about, hey, you know, what what is this bit over here do? Um, and I think that's a, a really, really nice way to kind of you know, kind of grow your own expertise as well as, um, you know, you can kind of benefit from the community experience mm -hmm. and talking through something. Well, you know, you can do that internally at an organization. It just widens the views, right? You know, it so does. many more perspectives, gives you so much more uh, kind of feedback on what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I couldn't believe how how much working at Red Hat changed my brain. Like, you know, I'd used open source. I've been involved in it a little mm -hmm. bit before that. But once I was working at Red Hat, I was like, now I, I don't really understand why all software isn't open. You know? <laughs> it's, like, like, it's really... Why that's not happening? Yeah. Well, talking about Red Hat, I, I used to work with um, 
uh, what was it? Oh my goodness, OpenStack. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, so I think that was the first time when I was interacting with uh, like data centers and actually doing mm -hmm. onboarding from you know self-managed VMs to delegated management um, of within uh, OpenStack. So that actually got me into infrastructure. So right, right. Credit must be due. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From Red Hat, I moved to containers pretty much after. Uh, instead of VMs, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, everyone was talking about containers right. anyway, so I took the opportunity and uh, explored it. Yeah, well, for me, uh, what really drove me about container, like, because I've been, I've been like mostly just kind of a developer, right? I've never mm -hmm. really worked ops, you know, um, and uh, they're just so quick, all right? Yeah. Like, you can, you know, you can whack out a container and like try something out and, you know, bang, you know, it works, right? Every time you don't have to worry about, mm -hmm. do I have all the right stuff installed? Do I have to spin up a VM to make sure I can get that version of Python, that, which is conflicting with this other project I'm working on? You know, so it's uh, like, I really, I really, really like containers. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, I get made fun of for it, you know, at the university sometimes. Oh, my goodness. So, I'm okay. I'm, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe off camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I'm posting, like, when I'm visiting KubeCons, I started to post this series of containers in that specific city. So, like, the actual oh. ship container. Oh, I saw your tweet. Yeah, yeah and yeah. now I'm getting a lot of, uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, banter for that. So, right. well, th yeah. th there's that. <laughs> yeah, I've... Um, yeah. I have uh, a couple of photos that I, I have in a lot of my talks, mm -hmm. which is actually flower pots and using that kind of container uh, rather than like shipping containers. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so a whole bunch of, you know, I have one I really like, which is basically like this wall of hanging flower pots of all different sorts. Oh, nice. um, yeah, because what I, what I kind of like, it's kind of like you're, you're trying to tell two messages at once mm -hmm. in the sense that I like using the mix of flower pots because everything all the containers are different mm -hmm. but at the same time the shipping containers what's different is the stuff on the inside right but you can stack them all together mm -hmm. uh, and that's a feature as well but uh, I just you know and there's out. the perspective as well when you see like all of these flower pots together it's just like this beautiful you know green wall right that you can right. admire and just like it works yeah. everything works <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah totally cool uh, I was gonna comment though on um, OpenStack when you were involved in that. I mean, yeah. uh, that was a, is right a, a, another really great community. Uh, mm -hmm. I was always really impressed, especially with what I think OpenStack really brought to the table for a lot of people, kind of unintentionally, was um, kind of config management and you know auto CI and all that stuff. They did such a good job mm -hmm. in that um, community of you know, auto CI for a very hard problem, right? Like mm -hmm. testing VMs and launching VMs and stuff is difficult. Mm -hmm. And it, it was so good and it was so open and so well documented and everything else. I really think it lowered the barrier to entry for a lot of organizations to mm -hmm. commit to their own CI and CD. I think one thing that I appreciated when I was part of the OpenStack community is this um, ecosystem, like the mm -hmm. idea of out of tree approach for your infrastructure. So you actually put components or yep. the building blocks yep. that already happen from from the Red Hat perspective. I think, well, I think this kind of uh, it's a more natural approach nowadays. But uh, back in the days, it was right. it was a bit in, you know, of an innovation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And another thing that I like is like these micro communities around projects as well, mm -hmm. which we can see within the CNCF as well, like with different SIGs and uh, different tags as well. So this kind of community work and um, maybe segregation of projects and interests, I think it's really, really nice kind of um, propagated within, uh, within the CNCF as well. I right. think influences came from different communities. Yeah. There's the Linux yeah. community, which actually had a very big say in terms of open governance and transparency and collaboration across different organizations. But like some of the, the practices, I think they, they came from our foundations, like the OpenStack ones. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. I think the, um, I, like I said, it's kind of like OpenStack, Kubernetes, you know, even Linux itself, or like the kernel, mm -hmm. um, you know, the protocols in place and the, you know, the techniques and all that stuff is really, because it's all open, mm -hmm. has really had a lot, or I hope, or at least I believe, right, has a lot to do with the change in the industry mm -hmm. in general to be so much more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, and I, it's been a really good thing because, you know, one of the things I just talk about with software is like people compare it to like building a building, mm -hmm. but it's really not. It's much more like writing a book in that you rewrite, 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 rewrite. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you cannot rewrite a building that yeah, easily. Yeah, then, exactly. Yeah. It falls down and people yeah, are unhappy. Yeah, not the right? best comparison right. indeed. So, uh, uh, and, but the, the kicker, right, unlike writing a book, I guess you kind of do with a book, but uh, mm -hmm. the kicker is we can actually test it, um, you know, without, you know, 
a, a car going over a bridge and falling in the river. Mm. Um, so, you know, and, and being able to make that a fully automated process such that the humans can just focus on the parts they need to work on mm -hmm. is such a big deal. Um, yeah. But that could also be me mostly showing my age because, you know, I've built, you know, a lot of software where we had very little ability to do anything automated. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to automation, I, I think within the scenes, yeah, it's great. Like what I would really like to see is to make it more human friendly mm -hmm. because, there, I mean, YAML is great. Yeah, like yeah. there are many people who assume the YAML engineer title and you know, like that's why they do a they full time job and, and it's fine. Um, YAML is good, however, it should be more readable. And it's not just um, yeah. within the Kubernetes, but like other tools that we integrate with uh, with our infrastructure. So I really would like to see a more simplified developer experience all the way through. I mean, it's great. It's been doing you know a great deal. We actually changed with Kubernetes industries and sectors across the world. Right. Um, but I still think when it comes to like the next stage, I would really like to see that more simplified developer experience and actually make it a no brainer and like it just work kind right. of situation. So I, I really would like to see that happening. And I think we're at the, you know, like at the edge of that um, initiative or some of the companies try to, to do that. Yeah. I, so looking forward to that. I yeah. could, yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, as much as I hate to say it, one of the things I kind of miss about XML mm. was the tooling around XML. it was so good <laughs> um, because XML was so horrible. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, but at least what it meant was you could, you know, get nice, you know, ways of kind of interacting with it. You know, mm -hmm. you could kind of test it to make sure that uh, it was doing what you thought it was doing, mm -hmm. um, you know, things like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, I, I had a friend who was, um, he did a, a little Python library that was, what do you call it? It was called like um, any converter or something, mm -hmm. but it would convert like YAML to JSON to, you know, whatever. And you could just kind of pipe it through. And, oh, and nice. uh, I was joking him around, uh, joking around one day about uh, XML. And so he actually in, implemented an XML output as well, oh, look at uh, that. mostly oh. to make fun of me. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. I thought using, oh, there is like a new initiative um, using spreadsheets to manage your containers. Uh, and it's called <laughs> and it's called sheet ops like with right, double e right. just to make <laughs> that is awesome yeah so pretty uh, much what you could do you could uh pretty much uh, see all of namespaces and the amount of uh, actually deployments you have in your namespaces and the amount of replicas and if you change the amount of replicas in your spreadsheets from like five to ten or like decrease it depends yeah. what you want to do that would actually have an influence on your cluster so it can I, get you know like these kind of ideas they're horrible but people implement them just for the fun of it right and, right yeah but again, I think this shows the um, interoperability. Like I'm, I'm trying to uh, actually when I presented that, I, I focused on the interoperability of uh, of our landscape rather than the actual shit ops principle. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, because every business is largely run on spreadsheets. Uh, as some horrifying them, as it is, some of them horrifyingly exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a bit, yeah. Yeah. Um, Nightmare fuel. It's still funny. I, I remember, I still remember being uh, brought in for a project when I was in consulting mm. um, where it was a team of five or six of us. And basically we were there so that this one person could retire. Um, and mm. basically we were building an entire system to replace this one guy's massive spreadsheets. Um, oh, and uh, yeah, it was... I can just imagine. Yeah, it was It was. B both, you know, like I said, horrifying and at the same time, you're kind of like ridiculously impressed at the same time, you know? It is, uh, like a whole business is running like on this entire spreadsheet. Right, right. <laughs> this is your backup, disaster <laughs> recovery, like this is everything, but yeah, not sustainable, definitely, especially for the employees. Right. Um, I'm looking around to make sure we're going in the right direction. It yeah. is a loop and we can't really actually get completely lost, but uh, my uh, brain has been known to try. So right. it's very nice. Like to be honest, like the colors and yeah, the yeah, yeah, it's just there, a beautiful. There is fall. something about the you know fall colors and all that. You know, mm -hmm. that, um, it's actually funny right now uh, in kind of near where I live in Boston. Right, there's a lot of uh, we get a lot of tourists who come and drive around basically to see the trees, mm. uh, and it makes the driving kind of terrifying in the fall. Um, oh, okay, okay. So because like, they're not locals, right? <laughs> and, ooh, and they'll slow down they and see Especially when they come from Britain, tree. like when yeah. you have to drive on the other side and everything. Yeah, 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 right, yeah, right. yeah the, for the full gist of it. Yeah. yeah. Um. So uh, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it, it's exciting. Um, yeah. It works as you get further north, like up into, you know, uh, Maine and, and all that jazz. Mm. Um, trying to, yeah. All right. 
I would like the nav to work again, but I don't know why it doesn't want to do its thing. I might have to pull it up. How on many my phone. engineers does it take? Yes, exactly. <laughs> I know that, so the car is is really smart, mm. and the problem is the car is really smart. Um, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that, I can't that's an, out. Mm, yeah. I think it's a good problem to have, maybe. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah, it's my first time in this kind of car, so right. Uh, uh, well, this is my first time driving an electric. Um, not, yeah. I mean, past was it full days, electric? But, it's not hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we actually plugged it in last night, um, which was another thing we had to like figure out how to do. How to um, charge. Yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, it's funny. It's one of those common problems, especially when you deal with like um, something that's like a really sophisticated piece of like technology. Mm. It's like you don't want to break anything. So, you know, basically we just didn't push hard enough, you know, because okay, okay, yeah. you want it. You don't want to like hurt it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, mm. you know, to take the, the oh. power out was all right. Think east, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, cool. Uh, so, oh, I, I forgot. I was going to ask you about the uh, the award you wrote, won recently. Yes, uh, that was the uh, uh, Women in Tech 100 Award, uh, which is um, pretty much celebrating the top most 100. Uh, well, top most technically. Um, uh, infused. I don't even know how to say that. Yeah. Can we retake that? Influential. Maybe? That's yeah. the word. Infused. Yeah. Technically infused, infused. Also, but you know. Yeah. Uh, so pretty much celebrating the top 100 uh, women in technology across UK, um, and that was a very big privilege because uh, I that was a very important milestone for me. I celebrated the launch of the Cloud Native Fundamentals course. I celebrated the launch of the. Um, KCNA or Kubernetes and Cloud Native Associate exam. So uh -huh. everything kind of happened at the same time. Oh, think, neat. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was a very um, kind of big push for me to lower the bar to entry for uh, Cloud Native. So through the course of actually explaining it from scratch, how can you apply Cloud Native principles? And with right. the certifications of, because it's a multiple, uh, it's a um, multiple choice exam. Uh -huh. don't, uh, with uh, other exams within the CF, like, um, like CKD and CKA and CKS, you actually have a terminal and you have to know the commands oh, to yeah. actually implement and, and pass the exam. While the multiple choice allows everyone with an interest in Cloud Native to still kind of demonstrate their knowledge and skills within mm -hmm. the space. So completely lower the bar to entry um, and yeah, get people cool. certified. So um, so when I applied for the award, uh, well, actually when I wrote the, the nomination uh, description, was uh, a lot of that work, and, and I'm happy that it was considered uh, influential enough for me to get an award. As well. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh uh, yeah. No, that's that's yeah. definitely cool. I think that's um, it's one of those things. that's, you know, maybe, to be honest, it's partially why I went to work at BU is um, mm -hmm. is you know my partially running joke right is I want more people who don't look like me in my industry. Yep. Um, and. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they, it's one of those things that's so hard that, you know, there's this really strong push um, that, you know, kind of anyone can be a programmer. Mm. And I think, it, uh, which I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, sure, anybody can be anything. But there's, I think one of the problems that technical people have is that they feel, because of how their brain works, they feel like what they do is very straightforward. Mm. Um and I think, because I'm one of those people, it's hard for me to get out of my own head to figure this out. But um, I think that there are some people who don't find it very straightforward, you know, mm -hmm. that they just think differently. You know, it's kind of like I was reading another article the other day about, you know, there's people who don't have an internal monologue mm -hmm. because they think in pictures yeah, or they yeah. think in emotions or whatever. And, uh, and it's still, you know, because I definitely think in words like all day, every day. Um, and uh, and so I think it's a similar kind of, you know, people just think differently. Mm -hmm. And so I think the more ways we can kind of find, uh, you know, opportunities to let more people kind of in the door, yep. um, you know, it's more than just, you know, is that stuff documented well? It's also recognizing that people learn and think differently. Um, yes, I could not agree more. So one of the things, I mean, I know it's going to be kind of a, a plug to the course, but what I worked really hard on is to provide different ways, so different methodologies to transmit information. So you mm -hmm. have audio, you have video, you have like write, like written text, you have exercises as well. Mm -hmm. Just like all like ways or like for people to adopt information or to digest information. So um, it's been way much more difficult to deliver the course because yeah. you, you yeah. could have just you know just written a, like a wall of text and that's it. But like getting all of this done, I hope that more students will feel more um, closer to, to the space and actually get involved. I really, I, like one of my motivations is just to make people um, 
inclined to get involved and, and be part of the community. And then once they're part of the community, I think it's going to go smoother. Right. Because right. Um, what I like about Cloud Native is um, it's one of the most welcoming place. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter where you work from or where you're coming from is like as long as you kind of share the same ideas or like not the same ideas but you sh you want to contribute share to the same source. values yeah yeah, yeah 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 like in a again like respectable way you know in a, in a transparent environment i think people will align and uh, will create amazing stuff well i also i think part of um you know the push that we have around like event driven architecture cloud native mm -hmm. um it also minimizes kind of the amount you have to know about the infrastructure for you to write your business logic, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're if you're an expert in something, you know, that doesn't, and you can do a little bit of programming. You can with serverless, right? You can you can write your little bit mm -hmm. without truly understanding, you know, how a Kubernetes cluster works, right? Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's a huge, hugely beneficial, uh, you know, thing to do because that way, you know, it's also kind of more welcoming. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of it, like I think it's funny because you know we talk about the positive aspect of inclusion being, you know, that we're welcoming to people and all that. Mm -hmm. But it's also very selfish, right? In the sense that I really, really want more perspectives in the things that I build or deliver mm -hmm. because they'll be so much better. Yes. You know, like if they yeah. can, you know, if, for example, you know, you're talking about trying to produce um, you know, content for people who are different kinds of learners than mm -hmm. yourself. So not only is it more work just in like volume, right? Mm -hmm. But also like if I try to produce something that is um, like, you know, for someone who learns better visually, I actually have a harder time doing that than I do written oh, yeah, because yeah. I learn from writing. Mm -hmm. um, but so I have to like put myself in a different kind of brain, right? Then to get yes. some feedback. But then if I can welcome, you know, kind of more perspectives into the space, I can get feedback on whether it's actually good for visual learners. Or even better, they can work with you right, and actually right. pre-produce that. Yeah, right? Because yeah. they, you know, they are leaders in that space and they know how it works and they right. know how to deliver that as well. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of uh, mention here, which I think is very relevant, is the language barrier as well. Mm -hmm. Because I think lately um, we have Asian communities joining Cloud Native. I mean, they've been part of the community quite a lot. However, yeah. for them to adopt, there is an actual language barrier. Like the documentation is mainly in English. Right. Not everyone is proficient in English. And there have been um, a lot of community members that translated or kind of produced or written books about Kubernetes in their own local language. Uh -huh. uh, so yesterday, the Contributor Summit, one of them was actually awarded uh, for translating or pretty much closing the, the gap between uh, English and Korean speaking um, oh, kind of cloud cool. native community. And yeah. I think that was oh, such... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the the yeah. regenerative braking on here is still yeah. hard to get used to because um, the car stops on its own oh. much more than a normal car does because it's using the braking to oh, charge yeah, yeah, the engine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's a little hard to like get the braking correct. It's like the smooth. Right. Because yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm normally a very smooth driver. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so, but the bra braking has been a little bit weird. Yeah, uh, so sorry enough. about that. No, but uh, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's really awesome about doing like multi-language. I've actually, it's funny, I've spent the last, uh, I think my streak is 250 days of uh, Duolingo with Mandarin. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Duolingo. Okay, yeah, well, when uh, I'm, okay, when I hear Duolingo, I can only think about their, uh, like, I mean, like their own TikTok as well. But yeah. goodness, mine, they have some dark humor sometimes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, so. I'm not sure I'm actually learning the language to be honest, um, yeah. but I am learning a lot of words, uh, and so it's been kind of interesting. Um, you know, I don't know. I just my. Uh, so what language do you do you go for? I've been doing Mandarin. Oh, Mandarin. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, and it's funny because um, I so I was actually born in France, yeah. um, and so my first language was actually French, mm -hmm. and uh, so now, but I don't really speak French anymore mm -hmm. um, because I stopped speaking when I was growing up. But any other language. I kind of like add a French accent to it because somewhere in the back of my brain <laughs> is like foreign means yep. French, right? So, yep. so like I kind of automatically do it and I've covered, I've, I've heard myself do it with Mandarin, which yes. is like all kinds of weird. Um, to but, be honest, like Mandarin itself is very complex because it's, it's a sound based language and you have to be very careful how you pronounce uh, yeah, things yeah. and then adding French on top. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> I cannot yeah. even comprehend yeah, so, it. So it's yeah. been a little weird, um, but uh, it's, you know, I mostly did it, uh, like I said, my, uh, my kids, you know, like many uh, teenagers, you know, have to pick what language they want to do in school. Right. Um, and uh, so 
uh, my son had signed up for Mandarin and I was, uh, cause I was trying to convince him to do Mandarin versus kind of one of the ones that you see all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and I was like, Oh, I'll do Duolingo with you starting over the summer to get you ready. So I, I just kept doing it. He, he stopped. Um, but he's now <laughs> taking an actual class. So he'll probably end up being much better at it than I am. Very um, quick. Yeah. Kids learn so quick nowadays. Yeah, it's just yeah. amazing. Yeah. Uh, but it's been fun. Uh, and, um, I partially, I also chose Mandarin too, because it is so different, mm-hmm. um, that I, you know, I wouldn't get bogged down in, you know, kind of like trying to use English, right. Mm-hmm. To mm-hmm. figure it out and stuff. Um, but yeah. I yeah. Know. What I like about Mandarin, I mean, maybe <laughs> yeah, this is like a completely different topic is the fact that you have actually science and it's a very uh, visual language to learn mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. And then the signs themselves, they, they make, well, the kanji, they actually make sense. So mm. like if you put them together, you can actually decipher them. And I think that's such a nicer story uh, well, or way of learning. And that's, that's where I've been struggling a bit with, um, with, uh, Duolingo is that, um, because I'm not taking a proper class. Like I can totally see how it'd be really helpful if you were taking it along mm. with a class. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not learning a lot about, um, kind of like how the language works mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as much as like how to say this sentence. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and, and I think I'm definitely getting some gaps there. Um, you know, but you know, that's kind of their teaching style, right? You know, I mean, yeah, um, it goes so, for a vocabulary. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I think I'd be a little bit better off if I was doing, um, you know, kind of it, it as a supplement to like a real class, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. um, but you know, maybe, uh, but I was looking actually at BU, uh, and actually take, I could take the class at BU. Um, oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So, so, you can, so that's some, you know, very nice perks of being a Right. Uni. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, enroll in anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I could just kind of, you know, take a real class. Mm. So um, another thing is I'm involved with Open UK. And this is a new nonprofit organization that um, tries to improve the usage of uh, open hardware data and software across the UK. Mm-hmm. So we're focusing on that area mainly for now. Um, however, uh, Amanda, our CEO, she's very, very inclined to make it like a worldwide kind of uh, initiative. So um, it's been great. I'm part of the leadership team at the moment, focusing on the future founders. So trying to get any new talent from the, from the UK and kind of um, uh, identify them and just make sure that they are aware of our organization and uh, can get involved in, uh, in open source early on. So that's what I'm doing with them. Yeah. Right. Unless I'm... Like, am I mis- like Liz Rice is involved as well. Yeah, but right? she's, uh, I think Liz Rice, she's on the governing board. Because that's yeah. who I just interviewed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 I was like, yeah, yeah, wait, yeah. That, am I, am, is my brain breaking? Yes. So, uh, uh, yeah. so we have, we have a governing board, we have an ambassador program, and then we have the leadership team. So my full title is chief feature founder. Uh-huh. So, um, and then we have um, like, within the leadership team we have people who focus on sustainability mainly or the uh the financial part of it it's, it's just like it goes uh, well, like right. a I mean, really really a long uh stretch you gotta run the whole kind of organization yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. yeah but like uh, yeah. i think it's very good to identify leaders in the areas and they can kind of create their own teams as well right um so as part of that we have an honors list and we again try to celebrate talent from university so um, last year we've um, identified 100 most uh, involved uh, students within open source and we celebrated them. We gave them a medal and everything, oh, cool. which apparently you cannot give a medal to anyone. Um, we had to make sure that from a legal perspective, like an actual British law perspective is going to be fine because only the royal family would be able to, to handle oh, the medals. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah. But Amanda, she, I mean, by background, she's Amanda Brooke, maybe I should mention her name. Uh-huh. Uh, by background, she's a lawyer. So. Oh. Yeah. And she got involved in Canonical um, uh, early on in her career, and then now it's all about open source. Huh. So yeah, she she made sure everything was fine. <laughs> that's really cool. But that's a very interesting yeah. nuance. Yeah, I, yeah, that's not one I ever heard. I think it's one of the interesting things. I don't know if it's still true, but um, if you're an American citizen and you get like knighted by the mm. uh, by you know the Queen, not Queen anymore, King of England, yeah, 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 um, yeah. Uh, you instantly lose your American citizenship. If you pick up a title in another country, because we're not allowed to have titles as Americans. Oh. Um, and I, like I said, I don't know if it's still true or yep. if that's what it, why it's an honorary um, thing yep. sometimes yep. for like being knighted. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's supposed to, used to be true. It, you also used to not be able to be a dual citizen, 
with uh, the U.S. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. It's um, a, yeah, one or one or not. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but well, thanks so much for uh, joining me. I'm sorry we we could have talked about the Open UK some more, but yeah, no, no, it's um, absolutely fine. I uh, I I was less lost than I thought I was, so I, but I was a little concerned. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thanks again. It was thank pleasure. you for having me. Yeah, it's a definitely an interesting experience, and I'm glad right. I, I'm right. done. I've done it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot of fun. Cool. Thanks.